Hello and welcome back to Quality Policing. I am Peter Moskos and I'm here once again um, with Jeff Asher, crime analyst and um, uh, head of, I don't know what your title is, boss man <laughs> at uh, Crime Analytics. Um, and he is sitting in hot New Orleans right now. I am in New York City and will probably uh, be joined uh, by Brandon Del Pozo, who is the... Um, former chief of police in Burlington, Vermont, and a former, well, I'm not certain if it's what his title, is he inspector? A uh, former ranking uh, officer and precinct commander with the New York Police Department. Um, so welcome, Jeff. You are, I think this is your third time on this. Uh, no, no doubt this really uh, helps your, your, your wallet and your, your media status by appearing more than once on quality policing. Um, yeah, well, you're retiring next week. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm just doing this now, you know, out of love. Well, actually, that's true, but not because I can retire. Um, and I should mention there is more at qualitypolicing.com <clears throat> and uh, including a link to the article we're going to be talking about primarily. So check that out. And you can also, um, from qualitypolicing.com, see a uh, my collection of violence reduction essays, um, which you didn't contribute to, damn it. But um, <laughs> but one day, maybe, there's still no deadline. Uh, but welcome back. So you had a, an article in uh, that got published uh, yesterday or the day before in Vox.com. I should mention, I always like to, that this is being recorded on June 13th, 2021. Um, and if you Google Vox and Jeff Asher, uh, it should come up. And it is also, it's, it's co-authored. It is by Rob Arthur and Jeff Archer, Ar Asher. Who is Rob Arthur? I'm unfamiliar with him. I don't know. He's just my, no, I'm just kidding. Um, the Rob is a, he's from Chicago. He's uh, very smart. He's a, um, I think he has a PhD in genetics. And he does a lot of, of, data stuff. He used to work for 538. Um, he, Rob is the one that did the math that found that the baseballs had changed and that the seams had been lowered. And that was why there was more home runs. Ah. Um, so, so he does all the fancy math and I'm just there for the eye candy, I guess, on most of our <laughs> stuff, but uh, we've, we've written a handful of things um, together. So this was uh, another good opportunity to write. So, um, the first thing people will see is a headline that says one possible cause of the 2020 murder increase, more guns. And I mentioned that uh, because after reading the article, I was like, that's not really what the article says. Um, and uh, we know um, authors don't write headlines and often they get them wrong. This one seems particularly egregious only because the more guns caused the violence increase in 2020 is a theory out there. Um, and there isn't, well, we can talk about that. I'm going to say there isn't really any data to point to that as a causal effect. And your article is far more nuanced. Um, but it does talk about the trends in gun arrests in how many cities? Seven, eight, six? We had, we had 10 cities of data, um, some better than others. So we talked about that there were 10 cities. Most of our examples come from uh, like a half dozen six to eight cities that had, had better data, um, like your your beloved Baltimore, the data's, it, it showed the same trend, but the, the, the data's kind of crappy on the arrest front. So, um, the, and you know, there's a couple other cities, I was just tweeting about Madison, Wisconsin, which we didn't include in the piece, but has quarterly data. Uh, we were really interested in the monthly, because quarter is also, is of quarter of 2020 was, was huge. The second quarter was April when everyone was locked down and then June when everyone was going crazy. So um, we, we really tried to hone in on the places with good monthly data, um, uh, which, which was limited a little bit to, to uh, you know, a lot of places just don't put good data out there. They don't. And I should compliment you. And I do some of this. I'll pat myself on the back to a lesser extent, but um, Jeff is fabulous and um, known, in fact, for collecting current uh, homicide data from cities uh, because the UCR and the FBI uh, doesn't do that. Um, and Jeff and I, Jeff's very 
nice about sharing data as researchers should be. Um, and so I've been able to look at this data as well. Hey, there's Brandon Del Pozo. We've already started, Brandon, but um, uh, welcome, Brandon. Okay. Um, so uh, I was just getting into the crux of Jeff's article. And um, so what, what do these data show, Jeff? Well, so what it shows, it, we really, what caught, uh, caught my eye was Jens Ludwig, who's at the uh, University of Chicago Crime Lab, did a piece talking about Chicago stops and how basically the number of stops plummeted in Chicago starting in March, April, and then continuing through the year. And there was a sort of this increase in May and then decrease again in June, July, and then it sort of increased for the rest of the year. So you saw the stop, the drop in stops, but what he found was that there was an increase in the number of firearms found. Uh, so with the sort of assumption being that unless police suddenly got really good at figuring out who they were stopping, um, stops, the, the number of stops still being random, um, that it was indicative of an increase of, of the number of firearms that were being carried. And so you can see that we looked at 10 cities of data. In all 10 cities, we found that the share of firearms per arrest went up. Um, again, starting in that April, May timeframe, suggesting before everything went to hell with the protests and gun violence increasing and whatnot, there was an increase in firearm carrying. Um, and then in many of these cities, you saw an increase in the number of firearms. So that's, that's undoubtedly evidence that there were more people carrying firearms. If, you know, you're, you have a, in Chicago, there was a 70% drop in the number of stops from January to May, but an 80% increase in the number of firearms found. So not just the share changing, but the actual number. Um, Tucson, Arizona, similarly had like a 30% drop in arrests and a 30 something percent increase in the number of weapons possession arrests. Um, and, and you saw that again and again in pretty much every city. Um, and then for a handful of other cities, uh, a lot of cities you saw it stayed high through the rest of the year. So like Philadelphia is a good example where the number of arrests plummeted um, in the in, in March, April, May timeframe. Um, and the share of those arrests that were firearms went from about three to 4% on average to 15% in April, um, seven and a half percent in May. And then through the rest of 2020, in September, it was 12%. In October, it was 9%. And it was 15% in November and 14% in December, where you were getting basically twice as many weapons arrests uh, weapons possessions arrests with 1, 1,500 fewer arrests. So uh, it, it's not 100%. And I, I sort of, when I do my analysis, I live in this place where we're, we're just trying to progressively advance our understanding of what's happening. And the idea being to provide evidence of certain hypotheses that then really smart people can go out and get 50 cities or 100 cities of data. Um, but this is certainly indicative that firearm carrying began substantially more often in that April, May timeframe, and then stayed there through the rest of the year. And so when I think about why murder rose last year, there was a cause and it was elevated for the first quarter and the second quarter. And so some of that I think might have been pandemic related, but the, when we really talk about why last year's murder increase was historic, it was everything that happened over the summer and everything that happened throughout the fall. And so let obviously- me just, Let me just repeat what you said there, because I think it's important. Um, murder was trending up in most cities and nationwide, um, 10, 15%, I would say it was sort of a standard. This is year to date, 2020 versus 2019. Um, and had it not been for the great increase that happened at the end of May and June, we would be talking about that 10, 15% increase because it's, you know, because that's a big increase on a year to, on a yearly level. But what followed it was so much greater that it's, it's almost, I don't want to say irrelevant because there's still people getting shot and killed. Uh, but there's, so there's probably, there are two separate things going on here and they don't negate each other at all. Um, but the big one happened, the big increase happened um, from June on. Yeah, the FBI's preliminary data had it at 7% after the first quarter, 15% after the second quarter. Some of that is June. So, you know, maybe we're still talking about a historically large increase in murder, but we're not talking about 
twice the previous historic high for an increase in the percent change. Um, so when I, when I think about it, I think, what are the causes? Why did people start shooting each other more often? And what are the accelerants? Why did it get so bad? And when, so when I think of this piece, I think this definitely fits in the accelerant bucket that you had so many more firearms on the streets that otherwise things that maybe not were shoot would not have been shootings. Um, you had people carrying firearms a lot more often, uh, which as whatever it is, and, and I think that it's very complicated what caused the increase in June, whatever caused that, those factors and what continued, what caused it to continue past just the protests in June um, was all put on steroids because basically twice as many people were carrying guns as were carrying before. Um, this is not hard and fast evidence of that, but I think it's, it's pretty strong, convincing circumstantial evidence. And I wrote the piece, so obviously I'm convinced by it, but, um, and, and so, uh, and the other, the other interesting thing that I, I think it, it doesn't inherently neglect, but it complicates is this idea that there was this drop in policing. There was definitely a drop everywhere. There was a drop in arrests. There was a drop in stops. Um, with the idea being that, okay, police everywhere weren't willing to go and get firearms. And that's not inherently untrue. There might've been just so many firearms on the streets that police were doing their, their less of everything, but we're still getting more firearms. Um, but it does certainly, it, it, it makes it difficult to say police weren't willing to go after firearms when all of the evidence from these cities suggests that they were getting for firearms more often than they were before. Um, and, and I think the positive read on that is police were more committed to getting the firearms than everything else. Um, I think it's just a, a complicating factor in something that Twitter, everything has to be simplistic and I think is pretty complex. Well, there are a lot of um, academics that are a little simplistic, I think, saying, oh, well, clearly violence went up because of COVID and sort of leave it at that, that economic anxiety somehow causes people to go out and get the gun they wouldn't have gotten before because more people bought guns and then shoot each other. I just, there's, it, there's a weird, it just doesn't make any inherent sense to me. And the data doesn't support that argument, which is why I think we got to look at this stuff. Now, let me, I, I am thinking from a sort of New York bias perspective because I live here and, and most of the cops I talk to are NYPD. Um, their answer, I think, to what you just said is, first of all, most guns are got, the bulk of guns are gotten by a very small group of officers, um, you know, in some specialized unit that's kind of, um, uh, um, you know, dedicated to, against trying to get guns off the street. So um, they, the rest of the cops in a way don't matter much for gun arrests. I mean, yeah, you might get one incident to arrest or you might stumble across one. Um, but in a way, for, at least in large cities, you have sort of, well, you have more than two, but at least two different police departments, one doing the routine patrol, and then a segment of the other focusing on guns. So um, those people focusing on guns could be doing the exact same job and guns, there are more guns on the street. Uh, I think we can assume that because shootings almost doubled. So of course they gun arrests go up. Um, that's just I was kind of go, yeah. Um, so what's this? So what? Um, I mean, just the, there's a simple correlation between gun possession and gun arrest, let's say, assuming cops are doing the same thing. Um, okay. Um, and then I, like, what, what else is it? What, well, what else are these numbers showing? And feel free to join in, Brandon, if you've got uh, well, insights, thoughts. But I think the other thing that they show is that it, it was, and we know this because shootings were up, but it was really widespread and it was everywhere and it was everywhere early on. And I think that that early, what be specific early being there? like April, May before all of the protests and everything. The gun um, arrests went up, you're saying, but shootings weren't up in April, May. Shooting, were shootings weren't up. I mean, they, they were elevated, I think, um, in a lot of places, like a couple of percent, the murder the murder number was elevated a little bit. Um, Something else I heard, which rings true, I don't know if it is, is that simply it was a lot easier to focus on gun offenders in, when COVID was at its peak, um, March, April uh, 2020, uh, simply because uh, those offenders were not, uh, were, did not, <laughs> were outside. They weren't doing the lockdown. Um, so the basically the 
percentage of people in any given neighborhood who were on the street and up to no good increased greatly during that time. Um, there are also, and I don't want to complicate too many events, but the world is complicated. Uh, there were a lot. There was a lot in in, in New York specifically. There was a big uh, release from jail in January due to bail reform uh, in December, really. Um, that would be December 2019, January 2020. And then there was another large uh, release from jail um, in uh, April and where the population of New York City jails dropped below 4,000 for the first time since I think 1946. The mayor issued a glorious statement celebrating that and then shootings um, <laughs> increased <laughs> immediately in May. Um, so I, I, I mentioned those because of course, as you know, uh, there's not a single factor, but we're trying to you know, break this down as much and figure out what happened. Um, and then there's the other thing, of course, is that the shooting increase was almost universal, though not everywhere. You know, Anchorage, Alaska saw murders go down 50%, and I've, no one seems to know or care. I mean, I, I don't know, uh, but you know, it's a bigger city than Newark, New Jersey. And uh, what was going on there? They had COVID, they had economic anxiety. Um, shootings did not go up in Canada or Mexico or really any other country I'm aware of in the world, which certainly means, well, what if this happened without COVID in America? I, I doubt it, uh, but it was not. I think COVID. that I think that speaks to our unique love affair with guns in this country. I mean, but El Salvador has guns in COVID and they saw a decrease in violence. Like, you know, not, yeah, the fact I, that we're the only country is, so the effect, let's say, is uniquely American. It may be because we have the combo of guns, bad mental health care, and uh, in poverty, and, and, uh, and a violent culture uh, inherently. But again, El Salvador and Mexico are, haven't been known as particularly peaceful places recently. So there is something unique to America, and that's why it seems like the protests um, post Floyd whether I'm not saying it's the only thing, but that clearly to me is the catalyst because first of all, it was largely uniquely American and more so it correlates perfectly with the increase in violence. Uh, that's when the violence started in, in most cities. If you look at shootings in Chicago, and I said this online, there's a very, they do this cumulative over the course of the year graph of uh, shootings. And there's, it's always interesting to look at the inflection points because I think, you know, just inflection points are telling. And two or three days after uh, the George Floyd murder broke, there's a noticeable inflection point in, in the, the increase in Chicago shootings. Um, you know, obviously it's just affecting for seasonal accounting for seasonality. Right. The, the, there's several years of overlapping uh cumulative lines right and then you impose the 2020 line on it and you see it breaks from the last few years in very distinct places where things happened in chicago that had nothing to do with the economy one was the george floyd murder um late may the second was there is a very um boisterous set of, of demonstrations rallies and protests that, that were where there was force involved in everything around Juneteenth. You, you notice it. And then a more subtle one when Miracle Mile, or what do they call it? The, the year Magnificent year, Mile. Magnificent Mile, sorry. Um, I, was Chicago, but I was born in yeah, Chicago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. When, 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 when there was some, some looting there uh, and the police were sort of hamstrung and fed up, there's a more subtle inflection point. And, and it'd be interesting to look at those. When you, when you look at New York's numbers, it's not the onset of COVID or the height of the lockdown or any employment uh events that that see the, the change in shootings it's it's the george floyd murder that that really where it starts to to take off right and it started and, in new york the day after um the p police precinct was burnt in minneapolis which, right um, right and then that's so, so so there's a few things and, and i wonder what what jeff thinks of them i mean there's so so the the relationship between crime and the economy is i buy that um I but don't. not necessarily. No, no, no. no hold on. <laughs> OK. When it comes to things like theft or insurance ah. fraud or bank fraud or even drug dealing, you can basically say like, you know, the, when the economy is booming, fewer people need to deal drugs. But the, the link between like shootings in the economy is much more tenuous. That, right. If you follow the logic model, it's just that like the economy goes bad. You lose your job. You don't have opportunities. You take the crime. The crime involves competing for turf with other criminals you can't re resolve it so then you start shooting each other like that that's the unless there's another logic model i'm unaware of the logic model is that the shooting is the way the illicit market like resolves market conflicts and the illicit market grows when the economy the the, the regular economy shrinks 
like that's I'd like to just know more about that hypothesis. I, I, I've never I think there's so many other things that could confound it, namely, um, you know, these social issues we've seen in 2020 and the police pulling back. And one other thing to say, and I, I wonder what Jeff thinks, this is retort that, um, you know, well, listen, in pro police cities, quote unquote, and anti police cities and cities that defunded and didn't defund, like the, the crime went up everywhere. So it wasn't just we hate you p- police Portland and Seattle and San Francisco type cities that suffered uh, in Austin where they really, really cut the police. It was everywhere. But like Peter observed, the st- increases in shootings in New York happened when the, when the precinct was set on fire in Minneapolis. And I think there were police all over the country in every type of city watching what was going on and saying, I'm not putting my, like, whether, whether I'm in a quote unquote friendly city or an unfriendly city, like, in the way that the protests were viral for protesters, the effects were could have been viral for the police as well, even in cities where they weren't facing serious cuts. So I know I packed a lot and, into that. And, but that's sort well, of, let me, yeah. I mentioned that Minneapolis police precinct because to anybody who has done the job, and probably many people who haven't, that was a huge event. You're not supposed to give up police stations. I was shocked. Um, now, at you know, at some point, what are you going to do? You can't, you shouldn't uh, just start, you know, shooting from snipers into a crowd. So, but it was, um, there were still police. If you're going to give it up, you can't have police officers in the station when you do it. Um, that was a big deal to cops. It was inconceivable. And then it happened. Um, so, I, yeah, I, I want to point that out as a specific um, inflection point. Also, so I'm looking at just data here in Chicago in uh April, there were 130 gun arrests, which is the lowest number perhaps ever, uh, at least as far back as this data goes, uh, which is to the start of 2017. Um, then it picks up again. Um, when these protests happen, so that's April, so that's, that's lockdown, right? Yes. Um, I would have expected to see a drop in June because a lot of the cops who would take guns off the street presumably were reassigned to protest detail. Um, But you don't really see that. There's a little dip, actually. Uh, But um, how, I don't know what I'm asking. Not not to jump in, but I was thinking this before, so I want to say it before I forget. It'd be interesting to know the circumstances of these gun arrests, how many of them were indirect response to shootings or the or the end result of an investigation into a shooting um, yeah and i don't want to versus, knock a guy who yeah. gathered the data because uh, it's good data to have uh, we always <laughs> well, that, that's where having more widespread stops data i think would be interesting because you're not talking about response to shootings you're talking about people you're pulling over it's sort of a random subset of your of the of the overall population um when we looked at the Chicago data, Chicago does have their uh, investigative stop data um, that you can sort of play with. And um, so if you compare, like trying to see, was there a change in who people were, who was getting pulled over, who was getting stopped, the the demographics didn't change at all in when the firearms, the share increased or the number of firearms increased. The, um, the amount of drugs that they were finding was the same. The percentage of drugs was the same. So it was just that the share of firearm shot, shot up, um, which it, again, seems to be suggestive of increased firearm carrying, um, but I would rather have 20 cities. There's only a handful of cities that have actual stops data that shows yeah, we, whether or not a firearm was found. We wrote about this yesterday. I, I'm, I'm leery of that percentage. Um, I mean, it's worth talking about. And again, I don't want to knock it too bad. I'm not here to, to give you a hard time, but I'm leery of that percentage of arrests that are gun arrests because I just think the denominator is so much more important in that case than the numerator. Um, I like, look, but the raw numbers I, I find quite interesting and in just how many times someone were taken. But I mean, you know, during COVID, cops were, you know, limited interactions, um, partly because fewer people were out and partly because they didn't want to get COVID, and though a lot of cops did. Um, so, like, of course, arrests went down. Um, and yeah, gun arrests also went down, but the percentage went up. But I just think that's, yeah, that that's such an odd month uh, that I don't know how useful that 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 figure is. Let me also, before I forget, um, when you mentioned, we're talking about 
the economic conditions. Um, I, it, shootings went up, let's say June 2020, dramatically, the inflection point, uh, you know, give or take a few days. Um, what bothers me how people say, oh, well, it's a clearly social economic conditions is those didn't change in on, you know, May 29th, 2020. Um, we have, yeah, yeah, of course, America is violent because of all those issues. Um, but the increase isn't caused by that because those didn't change on that day. Um, and the problem, if you look at macroeconomic conditions, it's too broad. Um, first of all, I find something a little patronizing and disrespectful to say, oh, well, of course they shoot each other because they're poor. I, I, no, most post poor people don't shoot each other. Most people in poverty don't shoot each other. Um, so the number of shooters in any city, like take New York, there are 8 million people. Well, last year, I think, what, 2,000 people were shot? Um, uh, um, let's say each person was shot by an individual shooter, which isn't true. But we're still only dealing with 2,000 shooters in a city of 8 million. So what happens to, you know, 8.2 million minus 2,000? I'm saying a lot of people are never going to shoot anybody in a crime, no matter how desperate they become. And that includes the vast majority of people who are extremely desperate in, in, in an economic sense. Um, it doesn't matter if those people have jobs or not. I mean, it does for them. It does for society. But in terms of violence, it doesn't matter. Um, what matters is those 2,000 maybe 3,000 potential shooters in, in New York City and in other cities it's even smaller. Um, now, did they lose legitimate jobs and start shooting anybody? I doubt it. I know most of them probably didn't have legitimate jobs before that. Did their economic situation change? I don't know. But were you, anytime you use a huge macro indicator, whether it's the unemployment rate or anything else, um, and doesn't, including non-economic indicators, it seems to miss the point that it is repeat violent offenders that need to be focused on. Um, and I think that's why the macro analyses always fail. No, I, I think that there's people that will go to any length. I mean, you can see the rhetorical line, battle lines being set. Like, I think that there's reasonable folks. I think the three of us are in the camp of reasonable folks. But it's like, hey, there's a lot of really interesting things that cause crime. And there's a lot of really interesting factors that prevent crime. And hey, police are one of those factors. The police can help prevent crime. But there are other people out there who say, like, no matter what, the, like, you know, this Alec, I forget his name, but he runs the Civil Rights Corps. I forget his last name. He had a, a thread on Twitter yesterday saying, um, police cause crime. The reason why we have crime is because of the, this is not just like, like the guy went to Yale undergrad, Harvard law school, like publishes all over the place. And he literally tweets out, um, the police are the cause of crime. And the reason why we have crime is because of the police. So what we're dealing with in that, he's the extreme case. And I cite him because he is like, not like totally tinfoil. Like they actually, people look past the tinfoil on his head when they, when they listen to him. Um, there are people who will go to any length to say the police have no effect on crime and we just got to get rid of them, abolish them, defund them. And so they make these arguments, on the other hand, that, um, you know, they give a free pass to, which is economy goes south and then violent crime happens. And then you have folks like us in this in this um, podcast trying to figure out, well, what is how does it really work? What's the logic model? Like, is it just within a month of everybody losing their jobs and they try to shoot their way into the drug market like do the conflicts that result in shootings when you engage in illicit market practices like play out over two or three months? Like what's happening here? And on the other side, what they do is just throw out these hypotheses. Well, it's the economy, stupid. And then they all nod and move on with, with frankly, like an agenda. Right. I mean, I think that's that's a little bit of it. Well, they, and know, so, like, they have the answers before the questions are phrased. I mean, we know what they're going to say, and it doesn't matter what happens in the world because they've they're going to say they're going to go to their little pet projects and and the causes they've always supported. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm sorry for sounding so indignant. I just I do. I want to say again, like, I think there's a lot of causes and a lot of solutions to crime. Um, I, I think the police play a huge role in all of this, but I don't think they're the only thing that's going to that reduce crime. But it's uncanny when you look at like Pete said very astutely, like what happened in the economy that that was like weirdly coincidental with uh with the George Floyd murder that's caused all of this crime, right? Whereas the, there is this other causal model, like the police were like, enough of this, I'm stepping back. And but so, the, yeah, please, Jeff. Go ahead, Jeff. I was going to say that I think when I think about the economy, one of the questions that we have to answer is not just why did it 
rise so much, but why did it, why has it stayed elevated for most of the last year? And so then like, I'm in New Orleans, you, you know, you get your experience from New York, essentially. I get mine from New Orleans. New Orleans had an increase in the June, July timeframe, and then a huge surge in the October, November timeframe. And so that's not tied to anything. And when I think about why did that happen, if you want to make an argument that the economy, you know, the, the stimulus money ran out and the, um, the unemployment insurance was, was denied and people had saved and the economic desperation was started. I, I don't know that it's inherently the case, but I think when you think about how do you explain why it has persisted through the fall, I think maybe it becomes potentially a more persuasive potential argument, but then, you know, there's been several stimuli since the last, the last six months. So what, you know, why is it still up? It's, I think right now I have it up 18% year to date relative to last year. So, you know, it, I think it's, it's um, for me at least, obviously the, the economy is a, a loser of an explanation for why it started in June. Um, because, but, because we said, I mean, unemployment skyrocketed when, in, when COVID happened. So I, yeah. I'm talking March. And then and maybe the economy was, okay, that's why it was up a couple of percent economic and and at least when, the first piece i wrote on this was last july before it was more clearly tied to j- everything that happened in june um and you had a lot of places like austin murder was up 40 something percent in austin through may um Daddy, what's all right okay. i want donuts hi this is this is andy asher making his his uh podcast hey, debut. My kids welcome to club the police all right go, yeah. go 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 yeah. nice bunny um, but so, so unemployment was going down after a huge spike. It was, it, it was steadily decreasing um, throughout 2020. Um, so one could say, well, it was still higher than it was. Sure. But like, again, you're trying to make that. <laughs> the, 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 the theory fit the data and it doesn't very well. Um, well, and I don't know that there's any one theory inherently that fits all of the data. Why did it happen everywhere? Why did it persist? Why was it up early? There's, and that's why when what I if, talk about what, it, what about? And I don't think this explains it all, but I think it's it actually is important. Um, and I don't, I don't want to oversimplify too much. What if people, because people who got arrested for carrying illegal guns weren't detained in jail? How about that? I mean, it, it's possible. Um, I don't know that we inherently have a lot of data on that specifically. Like we know. When jails were emptied, it was largely nonviolent stuff, which I guess weapons possession is inherently non nonviolent as a crime. Um, I I can't speak to that one way or another because I don't know that there's enough good data of what what was being released. I know in New Orleans, um, New Orleans went from about thirty five hundred people incarcerated um, in twenty ten to about a little over a thousand last year in 2019, late 2019. Um, and then when COVID hit, it fell to like 800 or so. So the drop, it was, you know, you're talking about a 20% drop from 2019 to 2020, but a, a tiny drop from 2010 to 2020. Um, or, you know, you, you've, already ex- you've already accomplished this huge drop over the preceding 10 years where New Orleans had this dramatic decrease in violence. New Orleans had the fewest murders they'd ever recorded in, 19, in 2019 and also had the fewest number of people incarcerated in 2019. So I, I guess I'm... And I also say, I mean, the problem is incarceration figures are also very crude because most people incarcerated have not shot someone. So sort of looking at the, you know, now you're even you know more of a data man than I am, Jeff. Um, but I'm willing to consider sort of logical theories and Brandon's a damn philosophy PhD guy. So he's always sort of going off the deep end on this stuff. Logic um, this, I, logic that. Yeah. I wouldn't want to, um, you know, make major policies just based on sort of theories in our head, but I'm willing to accept logical theory. If we don't have the data, I'm willing to sort of entertain logical theories that seem to make sense rather than say, well, we don't know because we don't have the data. Well, we're never going to have that data, but people are getting killed. You know, so yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I can't prove, you know, that it's all about the. But I mean, look, if you get a if you got arrested for a gun, and if if you literally get a ticket to say show up in court 
we don't know when because courts aren't functioning, but some point months from now, years maybe, um, you're going to have to answer for this in court and you are literally home with your same crew that night. Normally, I, I think the concept of deterrence is overrated, but at some point there's a deterrent effect, not just in, not just individual deterrence, but general deterrence. If there's no, I mean, you lost your gun, but that's all right. You got another. Um, that has to have an impact on gangs that are that may shoot someone. Is there was literally no consequence to getting arrested? I mean, what are they going to get arrested? If I, can, if I can say two things, when I was on the street in Chicago in 2017, visiting as the chief of Burlington, Vermont, just I went on a ride along and. I guess I want to say Haywood, but Austin, like the West part of Chicago where the crime, like the 11th district, I'm going to get this all wrong. So they look it up, but it's that part on Hey Jackass with like, everybody's getting shot. Yeah. The I, West said, side. I, want to, um, I have a friend yeah. who a former student of mine who policed there for a long right, time. Right, right, right. No. And so I, I was talking to the commander and he's like, listen, and, and this goes right into the, um, you know, the tragedy that happened with that 13 year old who was killed um, not too long ago. He said, there's no penalty for, for, having a gun in Chicago because there isn't a big penalty to begin with. And then they have all the kids hold the guns and the kids don't get any penalties. So uh, more recently um, there was a video of five people shot in Bushwick, Brooklyn uh, that made the rounds. I don't know if you saw it, Peter or Jeff, but it was, it was, it was broadcast on, on New York city area news uh, maybe two weeks ago. And it's, just a bunch of teenagers getting shot. One of them is 15 years old, ends up dying. And so it's the street corner in broad daylight in front of a convenience store, a bodega in Bushwick, Brooklyn, which is now yuppified or hipsterfied, whatever you want to call it. But one kid gives another kid a sideward glance. They exchange words, guns come out, then three guns come out, then everybody starts firing and kids run, kids get shot, five people shot. As a New York City cop for 19 years, the idea that you could have a street corner in Brooklyn in broad daylight on a Saturday where three people would have guns is crazy to me. I think there was never a time that I was a cop where, where people would feel comfortable with that many gun people would feel comfortable having guns on a street corner in broad daylight. And, you know, one of the things that, that stop pushing and frisk was, was practiced unconstitutionally in New York, but one of its effect, I believe was to raise the risk price of carrying guns. And I guess I go back to that, go back to 600,000 stops with the barest, pretext of criminality. But there was a worry, like if, if those 600,000 stops are even 680 at the peak or even like generally directed towards people who they think might be having a gun, you're raising the risk price of carrying a gun. And one of the things you can say is that risk price has evaporated for a lot of different reasons. To the point where on a street corner in Brooklyn on a Saturday in broad daylight, when one gun comes out, two more come out and then three people are shooting into a crowd. Yeah, it didn't used to be, you didn't have to, there, there did not used to be return fire in New York. Um, that is a new and unfortunate development. I have to push back a bit. I understand your logical point about risk price, but it's also important to mention that when stop, question, and frisk was at its most absurd peak, um, shootings were not actually going down much. And the entire decade from uh, 2010 to 2020 was somewhat uh, of a level um, period. No, that's I mean, a really from, good point. From two, I mean, sorry, from 2000 to 2010. Um, the, the decrease happened before and after stop and frisk mostly, which is, you yeah, know, I, 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 so right. So I'd say, I think that there was a, a total loss of marginal returns at that point. Like it was just literally, you'd be told in the NYPD, you better have better numbers than last year. Like regardless of what, what it did not have to correspond to crime. You just need to have better enforcement numbers than last year. And the logic was literally, you you don't know whether crime will go up or down. I was told this by commanders. You don't know whether crime's going to go up or down. You could try to fight it and try to keep it down, but ultimately you can't control that. But what you can control is your enforcement numbers. So you always want to have better enforcement numbers than last year. So no matter what actually happens with crime, you could show that that you were trying as hard as you could. And in fact, you were improving upon last year's results. Like that was the perverse logic. Um, in the last episode of this podcast, um, former chief of department, Lewis Animone was going bonkers at this concept. Um, and he was saying, they heard, you know, people, we need more touches. And Lou was just going ballistic because he said, no, this is not what policing is about. This is you not how you bring down crime. Yeah. And, and uh, with my colleague, Arthur Storch, uh, who was also precinct commander was saying, you know, you end up stopping people who, um, I mean, to, this is to put it mildly, don't need to be stopped. You're stopping people who are easy to stop simply to produce numbers. It became a stat based frenzy. 
Right. So I'm sorry for like equivocating, but I feel like um, you're right. However, stops are down like 98%, right? So we went from like this, this, this gross, gross, gross amount of unnecessary stops that have all of the not unconstitutional against the wrong people, have all the neg- negative things that we just discussed that make them permissible. Then the pendulum swings and like virtually like disband the anti-crime unit, nobody's getting stopped anymore. Well, let me Here's go- where I'm going to complain about New York's data. Yeah. How is it that that data is not online? I know that they, they have, I think, the 2019 stops data is online. They, I think 2020 is online. They publish quarterly. It drives me nuts that you that the, the premier police department in the nation does not have its open data hooked up to be automatically updating every day, that they do it quarterly several months after the fact. It just drives me crazy. But I will give them credit that there's a lot of data online, though it's not, It yeah, it, it's not. I may be the most annoyed person in the world at this fact, but it sounds like a job for Jeff Asher. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Tell your friends. Uh, But the data they do have is good, but it's not. Yeah, it's it's up to last year, basically. Um, But there's a uh, it is worth pointing out that they're New York City. They're they're mandated. Uh, They put out a lot. The NYPD puts out a lot of data on on everything, uh, which I like looking at. But, yeah, you're not going to get recent data. but only, you know, Jeff, you, you're one of like the eight people in the world that wants uh, last week's data. Um, where <laughs> the rest of us are stuck looking at Comstat <laughs> and it comes out on Tuesday. Um, you know, so the thing about stops, I would argue when, when, when the illegal unconstitutional part of stop question and frisk it ended, New York cops were still stopping people based on legitimate reasonable suspicion that needed to be stopped. Mm-hmm. Um, violence actually went down uh, during that era. And that's important to point out that the police department was still doing a very good job. Chicago had a different story. I want to get the year right. I think it was the start of 2016 when um, cops there stopped stopping people uh, because the report was made long and onerous and was going to the ACLU who was look, was looking for cops making illegal stops or at least not writing them up correctly. Um, when Chicago stops plummeted, uh, murders and shootings skyrocketed. Uh, so, so, and I, I mentioned that partly for its own sake, but to, earlier we asked, well, why haven't shootings gone down again? I'm, I'm afraid that we are at a new normal because we saw that in Chicago. We saw that in Baltimore after the riots um, related to Freddie Gray uh, in 2015, where shootings, that was the first time in Baltimore uh, where I saw anywhere that it wasn't trending up. Shootings were at X level on one day, and then there were at 1.7 X the next day. Um, There was just a complete break. It wasn't even an inflection point. It was just a a doubling almost. And basically it stayed there ever since. Um, So I'm afraid that you get one style of violence when cops police one way, and then another when cops police another way. Um, And we're sort of stuck here now. Um, That's my fear. Yeah, and I, I mean, I guess the the challenge, I mean, New York did okay, and not New York, excuse me, Chicago did okay in the years after their surge in bringing violence back to where it was yeah, before. Yeah, kind of, sort of. Sort of, I mean, they, they were making progress. Yes, they were making progress. As opposed to Baltimore, which was, you know, has been, what, above 300 murders every year since 2015? I mean, it's it's been kind of luck and randomness is the thing that's been driving whether or not murder goes up in Baltimore. Um, so I think I, I would agree with you that we're, we're sort of at this inflection point now, a year later, where nationally, either we see things very slowly trudge down and people do good work, um, or we are more like a national Baltimore where this is the new normal. And right now, murder the last time I updated murder was up 22% or 21% nationally um, in the 67 cities that I have data for. And so if that number happens this year, we'd have the most murders we've ever recorded. Um, so well, I numbers, don't think I mean, the numbers people... are up this year because only now are we well, that period of the 2020 increase. We're, so we're just exactly. catching up with, we're just catching up with, with the murder. Of George so it, it, that, that'll come up. That should come down in theory. Um and, but let's say if we have another 10% increase, we're still talking about one of the highest rates of murder right now. Um, I guess the question is, are we, is it, is it possible for us to get back to where we were, you know, let's maybe 2014 is no longer the goal and it's 2015, 2016 is the goal. Um, 
which would be substantially fewer murders than we had this year and last year. And, and part, yeah, part of what also bothers me about a lot of the discussion around this is there's this sort of people throw their hands up and go, well, I mean, this is the way it is. And I, I'm saying I'm afraid this is the way it is. But so I mean, Chicago had 769 murders last year and 519 the year before. Um, Baltimore had uh, 335 last year, which was actually down in 2019. But Baltimore had fewer than 200 murders um, not that long ago in 2011 and 211 murders in 2014. This is an ancient history. Um, I don't see why we couldn't go back to that, but apparently people say, well, we can't go back to that model. Well, I don't know. I, why not? Why not go back to a model of, of, and it's not only policing as Brandon said, though. I mean, I focus on policing because it's my professional field. And also, cause I do think it's the single largest uh, variable that influences quick changes in, in, in violence or changes in policing. Um, but yeah, we just not, you know, to put it in perspective. So last year's increase, do we, are we saying confidently yet, Jeff, what it was? No, uh, the FBI had it at 25% okay. from the available cities, but they were missing New York, Chicago, New Orleans. So I think, right, but so, you know, 25% give or take. Um, and, and to, to, to the, the largest previous yearly increase in American history was 1968, which uh, I got right here. It well, was a 12.7. No, uh, right. No, no, no matter what, right. If you're leaving out New Orleans and, and, and New York and Chicago, um, you know, you're leaving out percentages that are big ends that will also really, they're not only greater percentages, but they're, they're, they're more powerful weights as well. Yeah. And, and so, and they're America's civic heart. Like you, you want to know, like when we think about the essence of America, we, you know, New York is peculiar, right? Because it's, it's got, it's the head of, it's the head of culture and finance. It's as, as well as just the big city. Um, Seattle is a weird city as well. But then I always say the future, like the essence of America, of urban life in America is Philadelphia, Detroit, Baltimore, St. Louis, Houston, Dallas. You get the point, right? Cities that don't have some cultural or financial silver bullet that are that are fairly diverse, um, that maybe are economically struggling. But when we think of, yeah, you know, that's an all-American city. Those cities did terrible last year when it came to urban violence. St. Louis not, recorded the highest murder rate of any American city that's ever been recorded above 250,000. Yes. And it's St. Louis. Like I think of as a person born in Brooklyn and who policed Burlington, Vermont, I recognize like I'm pretty boutique in my cities. Like when I think of the essence of America, I think of St. Louis and that's, and to just write that off as an aberration or, well, it's not happening everywhere is to really miss something profound going wrong in America and bringing it home. I don't know. You must've seen these videos of Fells Point last, last week, yeah. um, Fells Point, Baltimore. I mean, Peter knows probably Fells Point like inside and out. I had dinner there a few times in town, loved it. I wouldn't, if I saw, if, I would not go outside in Fell's Point if that's what it looked like uh, now, right? With that level of disorder and violence where people are beating the crap out of each other, there's shootings, they can't even establish a crime scene. Like that's a that's a huge problem with our civic spaces, regardless of the murder rate. If if there's not a single cop to be seen in Fell's Point and shots ring out, five people get shot, everyone runs away, and you still can't even establish a crime scene because people there was are messing with evidently within 25 feet of the shooting and you know, was unable to identify the suspect right? i don't know why don't you say something about that piece since i'm well, since it's your first i want to say home, i yeah. honestly believe and i'm not well i guess i am biased i i think fell's point is one of the world's great neighborhoods let me just say that and i mean that literally from i lived in amsterdam i live in new york it's a fabulous place um it is you know now it's it's considered a sort of yuppie richer part uh in, in baltimore but it's still yeah let me just, anyway, I, I just want to say something nice about Fells Point and Baltimore in general. Well, um, I loved since, it. It's, since, yeah, it's one yeah. of these great American places is what but I'm so saying. So since that shooting and the, and the response to it, which has been large in the media and politics, there's also been pushback going, you know, so the business people have written letters saying threatening to withhold taxes if the city can't um, ensure basic public order. Um, and 
there's been pushback going, yeah, wait till the residents of the East and West side, you know, Eastern district and Western district in Baltimore. Um, why are they paying taxes? Cause the city hasn't been able to maintain basic order there for, for, you know, for decades. Um, Fells Point is, is, is a largely white neighborhood. Um, so that's part of it. Um, the other victim, most shooting victims and, and are, are, are black. So why don't they get the same attention? I, that's, I, it's important to mention that it just needs to be out there. That said, I, I just want any of these shootings to get the attention. They matter. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know why people tend to dismiss shootings in St. Louis or, or parts of Baltimore or Chicago as just, well, you know, that's what happens. No, no, it's not just what happens. There are a lot of people there living in fear. Um, it, but it seems that it takes a shooting in Fells Point or anti-Asian hate crimes or some white college girl getting killed before people care about any of this. Um, and it, some, you know, people get mad when I say that sometimes. Oh, we care. I know certainly people who live there and the victims and their families and their loved ones cares, but I'm talking about society in general. It doesn't seem to, just seems to accept violence in certain areas and, and not others. I'm for not accepting it. And if it takes the, the sensational um, sentinel event to, to, to wake people up, that's, I, I'm, I'm, I'm fine with that. But the question is then what do we do about it? Um, and that's of course, of course is a lot tougher. Um, I'm, well, actually, no, we're going to make it another episode. We might actually do it in the same sitting, Brenda, but I, uh, I would do want to talk about your, mm. um, your op-ed about Washington Square, because that relates very much to the Fells Point uh, situation. But we're going to hold off on that, because... Uh, <laughs> stay tuned, everyone. Yeah, stay tuned. Um, and Jeff, you're welcome to Rahman. stay around and join us. Join us for well, I have screaming going on here. <laughs> um, yeah. So what, what, what was it about Fells Point? Yeah, it, it's... Um... What, what I was saying about it is, is, is it, it looked like the quality of America's civic spaces matters, and it matters not in some, like, hipster, yuppie, like, boutique experience way. Like, whether you're coming from the, whether it's the east side of Baltimore or you're coming from Baltimore's mansions or you're a Hopkins professor or you're... Wherever you should all be able to go to Fells Point and enjoy a meal and not worry about shots ringing out and people beating the crap out of each other. And I think in a lot of civic spaces from Washington Square Park to Fells Point to to Times Square, like we've given up on the idea that like it's vital for a democracy for people from all over to be able to make like good, safe use of a shared space. We've just given that up. And, and some of that results in violence. And some of that results in disorder, but it, it nobody benefits from it. And, and it's a cop out to say, oh, that's just the rich business people complaining. Like, no, like it, it's it's the, the West. What I loved about the West Village, and maybe I'm getting ahead of myself episode wise. Yeah, podcast, get, get, but, but, yeah, don't get to that yet. Let me let me interrupt. Okay, I, okay, I don't want to get to that. Um, I, I want to stay focused on, Jeff, on, yeah. on Jeff's article a bit. Yeah. Um, let's do some hypothesis testing. Um, OK, more people are carrying guns. Uh, that I think we can say is a given. Um, and Jeff's data shows that, and more shootings show that as well. Carrying illegal guns, I'm talking about. Um, you know, there's just such a predictable crew of the anything, the anything but police brigade. The police are the problem brigade. So rather than sort of, I think, looking at more obvious police things, they say, oh, well, gun sales are way up. Um, so clearly that would increase shootings. Now, is that true? What do you think? And not inherently by itself. Um, the you know it's the old maxim: guns don't kill people; people kill people. I mean, I, I certainly would laugh at that as a as a concept. But it, as far as like what drove murder up, I don't think that it was just gun sales or gun carrying. Otherwise, we probably would have seen this huge surge in murder coming in January, February, March, April. I also think a lot of people who say that are. Um, you know, not part of America's gun culture. Um, they seem to be shocked every time they learn that people carry guns. Um, this is America. God knows how many hundreds of millions of guns are out there. Um, but legal gun sales were up dramatically. Uh, and my thought is, I, I mean, at some level, yeah, I wish we could change, personally, I wish we could change America's gun culture and be like less violent nations and a fewer guns and shootings. But I'm not worried about legal gun sales uh, because yeah, most gun owners aren't shooting people, the, you know, and, and most guns aren't used in crimes. Um, I just don't believe that um, legal gun sales somehow led somebody in New York to say, Oh, 
yeah, I'm going to start carrying a gun on the street. Like, I just don't get that cause and effect there. Um, but I don't no, know how it, we can prove or disprove it. It doesn't. One of the great mysteries is the denominator of gun ownership in or gun, not gun ownership, but gun possession in places like New York and Chicago. Like whenever stops might be going up and reco- whatever recoveries might be going up, but um, we don't know vis-a-vis what number of gun possession or what amount of gun possession that that's corresponding to. But anyway, I, I, that wasn't a very articulate way to phrase it. The number of straw purchases obviously matters, right? Or gun sales going up. If, if Texas passes a law where anybody can buy a gun with no private sale, no background check, no restrictions, no concealed carry, no nothing, will that result in straw purchases that end up going to cities where they're used in homicides? Like, yes. Yeah, so maybe they're, yeah. Logically, yeah. but I also like, is there anybody who wants a gun who can't get one? I just think the supply is already so immense, similar to drugs, that supply side interdiction, though noble and perhaps still has to be part of the strategy on principle, I think it's futile. Um, I don't think anyone suddenly last year was like, I can finally buy that gun I've wanted for 10 years, but maybe I'm wrong. Well, maybe it wasn't so much a supply issue as a demand issue that the, what we're, what we're seeing is that the pandemic made people want to carry guns more often. Um, and then people might actually go well, buy for and they put out orders. Possibly, and, and obviously the supply wasn't an issue. So what we have evidence of is that the, the interest in carrying was up before the interest in using was up. Yeah, much more sympathetic to the cause and effect working that way. And it, and it, and it would be interesting to know, you know, most homicides, unfortunately, are not close to arrest. But when they are, um, what percent were committed with like, Number one, legally possess guns. And number two, recently purchased guns, right? Like what's the, when you're locking it, the shooters that you do lock up, how many of them were, were ones who bought guns during the, uh, yes, I, the, my shooting was done with a gun that I purchased during the pandemic legally from a gun shop. Yeah. I mean, you know, any, anybody that deals with crime stats knows that it, these would all be these beautiful things to have or just all I want is to know how many murders there were last year and it's June and we still don't know that. So we're just figuring um, out how many overdoses too. So it's all, it's all yeah, crap. May, maybe we'll figure out that a higher percentage of shootings of, of murders involved firearms. Um, but aside from that, I don't know how much more we can answer there. In in New York, the percentage of murders committed by firearms has gone up. Um, it was amazingly and blessedly low for a long time. Um, and, but, and, I like comparing New York City to Newark, New Jersey, because um, they're literally a subway right away. So um, I'm hesitant to say the percents, but I think it was like 70 or high 60 percent in New York were were firearm related. And this is on a very low level. And across the river in Newark, New Jersey, um, it was your standard American urban rate of like 80 or 90 percent. That, you know, so I would say local policy matters because. Yeah, people. Didn't. Well, New York is much lower in in terms of the percentage of murders that occur with a firearm, and that helps the clearance percentage be much higher than most cities. I mean, if you look at the uh, scatter plot of percent with firearm versus percent cleared, New York is all the way in the top right corner uh, with you know high high clearance. I guess bottom right corner, high clearance, low percentage. Baltimore is at like you know thirty percent cleared and. 90% with a firearm, as is New Orleans and other cities like that. Hmm. Let me wrap it here, just because I see we've been at it for, I try and cut these once they get over an hour. Um, uh, I do want to point out again, Jeff Asher's great piece in Vox.com. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, I'll just stay one possible cause of the 2020 murder increase. I'll leave the headline at that because the next two words, more guns, don't actually. I, uh, I thought about I thought about emailing my editor. I was like, could you do contributor uh, rather than cause there? But it was, you know, Saturday morning. But what you do show is that there's in there are indicators that gun illegal gun possession was going up uh, in in the earlier parts of 2020. Um, which I think is an important um, contribution. And, and you're not saying it's definite, of course. I don't, among ourselves, we don't need to give all the caveats we're thinking of. I know, I know you, you don't stretch <laughs> your data, um, so I don't want to do it for you. Um, but it's an interesting piece. Um, I, I'll link to your data on the website because you make that, you, anyone can look at it, right? 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, it's um, all open and, data. So yeah. Um, and that'll be at uh, qualitypolicing.com. Um, I am here with uh, Jeff Asher and Brandon Del Pozo. Thanks for joining hey. us. And um, it'll be a separate episode, but um, uh, we're, we're going to morph right into uh, uh, Brandon's article about public order in Washington Square Park in New York City. So um, stay tuned for that. And thanks for listening. Yeah, Jeff, it was great to meet you and connect. I love your work online. Ooh.